Welcome to We Are DB. I am Brenton, joined as always by Danielle. That's me. Thanks again for joining us this week as we count up the IMDb's best movies of all time and discuss some of the greatest films you mightn't ever have seen. This week, Raiders number 34 on the Internet Movie Database by millions of film lovers from around the world is Parasite. <laughs> Released in 2019, Parasite is a comedy, drama, thriller set in Seoul, South Korea. I'm not really sure what kind of genre this is meant to be. Is it Seoul? It was meant to be set in Seoul. I think it's meant to be set in Seoul, South Korea. Okay. Based on an original screenplay, the movie is written, produced, and directed by Bong Joon-ho. So, you haven't really heard of Bong Joon-ho before, have you? No, and I remember the first time we saw the trailer for this, I'm like... Mm, and you're like, oh my god, I love that guy. I didn't know he was making a new movie, and then I saw the trailer. Yeah. Um, and by the time we actually watched the movie, I hadn't remembered anything from the trailer. So um, he has written and directed seven titles, and a few of them are in the top 250, so we'll probably be getting to those. The lowest rating of all of them is 7.0 out of 10, which is really good. He's got a very good track record. So I first heard of him back in 2013 with his movie Snowpiercer. Have you heard of this one? Mm -mm. And then again, he released another one for a Netflix special, Okja. O-K-J-A. I think it's Okja. I don't don't know how to pronounce it. I haven't seen that one, but I I really wanted to. Uh, So those are the three that he's done in the last six years or so. So what's his MO? Like, what kind of genre does he generally work with? He really strikes me as the kind of guy who makes whatever movie he wants. He writes it, he directs it. And that's kind of really impressive because usually for someone like this, he's getting pressure from the studios or he wants to go where the audience is going, where the money is going. He doesn't seem to give a shit about that. I could be wrong, but just from looking at the content that he's made, he makes some weird stuff because he wants to make some weird stuff. He wants to sort of give a message. Usually most of these things he gives a message. So I just wanted to list off, obviously um, he's had other movies, very impactful movies, particularly in Korea, before 2013 Snowpiercer, but Snowpiercer had a lot of English actors, and it was it was in English. So that's mm-hmm. probably why it had more of a wide release. So that's mm-hmm. the first time I saw him. Um, and Okja was on Netflix, so it also had a very wide release. And this one, obviously. But mostly before Snowpiercer, it was more Korean stuff, and now he's become sort of a worldwide household name. And he's, he seems to really be trying to give, uh, like, a big message or two that he wants to show in each one of his projects. I was just going to list off mm. and read the description of his last few movies uh, off the okay. IMDb just to show you how some how strange these are. Do you have the ranking of those either? Yeah. I'd yep. like to know like what they are and where they sit. He had one in 2003 called Memories of Murder. I'm not really sure what that one's about. A small Korean province in 1986... Three detectives struggle with the case of multiple young women being found raped and murdered. So I believe it's kind of like a murder mystery and it seems more serious. Uh, That's an 8.1 out of 10. So that's I've heard of that one. That's a very good one. That just seems very typically true crime. It is, yeah. Yeah. Maybe this was before, this was 2003, maybe this is before he was doing more of whatever the hell he wants. Uh, So Snowpiercer, Mm. 10 years later, 7.1 out of 10. I really quite liked it. It's a bonkers sort of storyline if you actually try and think about how these this actually works or the logistics behind it but mm-hmm. it's entertaining as hell and i think it's got a really good message and i, I really quite like the acting in so it as well so what is it about um in a future where a failed climate change experiment has killed all life except for the lucky few who boarded the snowpiercer a train that constantly travels around the globe a new class system emerges it's a really like it's a, it's a constant train that just goes around the world on loops, and it's been gone for about eighteen years. I love dystopian stories. It's such I don't a weird know why. premise, and each carriage of this train is a different like has a different class. Yeah. Oh, that's it's a weird. really cool movie. It's an interesting concept. Yeah, it's completely crazy if you try and think about it. What were we watching? Oh, downsizing. Like immediately, that's what 
that brings to my mind. That was an interesting premise. Yeah. I hated that movie, though. <laughs> it was just executed terribly. Oh, it could have been so good, and it was just so bad. It could have been, especially with the people behind it. So Snowpiercer, the main guy, is Chris Evans. Righto. And it's got Jamie Bell, who's also an English actor, um, and Tilda Swinton. There's actually quite a few actors in there. I think John Hurt's in it. So then a few years later, he had, I'm going to say Okia. Okia? Okay, That's probably a good guess. Yeah. A young girl risks everything to prevent a powerful multinational company from kidnapping her best friend. A fascinating beast named Okia. So it's kind of like he made up this animal that looks like a hippo crossed with kind of like a dog or an elephant. It's a oh, really I remember big, that. It's really strange. That's also got Tilda Swinton, and I think it's got Jake Gyllenhaal in it. Was that an English language one? Yes, that, so that was another English language one. Okay. Weird. Yes, I vaguely remember that, and I remember looking at it, and I'm like, what the hell? And then this, this one came out, Parasite. Um, so, to me, it's sounding, and I mean, people are going to jump on me for making this comparison, but to me, he almost sounds more like a Spielberg, where he'll make all sorts of different kind of stuff, but do it his way, as opposed to Christopher Nolan, who sticks to a particular genre and like he does sort of flavor. stick to a genre like even christopher nolan has been subject to push from studios what typically with dark knight rises is a is a great example what i mean with that is that every christopher nolan has that flavor it's got a nolan flavor you yeah know what i mean not every spielberg film has a spielberg flavor you yeah okay I mean? all right yeah He's sort of just doing what he wants in the side of sort of the way that Tarantino does. When he f- he gets an idea on a project, he puts okay, all of his energy yeah. into it. Gotcha. Better comparison. Yeah, I Got mean it. Tarantino definitely has his own flavor. I haven't seen enough Bong Joon Ho to know, but as soon as I saw his credit on the thing, I thought that's going to be a great movie because he really covers interesting concepts. So S- Snowpiercer, it really had messages of class systems. Mm -hmm. and showing off the struggles with those class systems, and they had a big climate change message behind it too. Okja, I believe, had... uh, It was talking about most multinational companies and the amount of power that they have and animal rights message behind that. Again, I haven't seen the movie, but that's what I definitely got from the trailers and I've watched the reviews and things. Uh, And this one, I believe, has a lot to say about class as well. Um, not in the same way that Snowpiercer does, but I think that he's got his own messages, which we will get into more uh, into the episode. This one definitely has messages about class behind it, and it's also got... Like, I hate to say everything's about the human condition, but, like, it's looking at the way people think and the way people are motivated. It's interesting that you took that away. I think that's just what you're bringing to it. I don't know if that's what he was trying to say. I'm just thinking if you put people in this situation, I don't think most people would do what they did, and I don't know Yeah, that, okay, we'll get into that. You know what I mean? The... Yeah, exactly. So that's all, that's all I'm going to say about that for now. So here on WeRDB, we have sort of an unwritten rule where we don't like to cover recent movies, anything that's just been coming out in cinemas because it's... It becomes inflated. So what happens is something comes out, everybody gets really hyped about it and they think it's amazing, so they're going to hop online and they're going to, you know, rate it really, really highly because it just came out and they're so excited about it. But tried and true, with time, anything is going to spike and then it's going to taper off and it's going to settle somewhere lower than what it originally came in at. Yeah, and we explained that more on the very first episode, the We Are DB introduction, where we explained what we're doing with this podcast and what our picking process is. Uh, we basically said that you need time, basically, to sort of make a great movie. What is going to be remembered in people's minds, and that's what the IMDb list is for, is ranking classic movies. And you need time for classic movies. Yeah, Like, there's a reason why the Godfather movies are up there. Yeah. Right? And they've had a lot of time to be soaked into people's memory, rewatch them over and over again, get to understand the context that they were released and what the motivations were and all the stories have come out about it. It's done. Mm. You know what I mean? It's got its Oscars Mm. and everything. When Avengers Endgame, for example, came out, it was number two. It was only behind Shawshank Redemption. Right now... Six months after that movie has come out, it's like number 60. 
and it's kind of plateaued. That's kind of where it deserves. But it's going to everyone, sit, yeah. yeah, it settles, right? Everyone comes out with this review buzz, and everyone's hyped about it, and they rank it. So basically, the unwritten rule that we have here is it has to be out for at least six months before we'll look at it. That's why Joker is currently number nineteen, but it's only been out for two months. Give it mm. a few more months. Let it be settled. Let it, you know, people actually understand what is this movie, and then we'll look at it. So we're kind of ignoring that at the moment. And it does take that amount of time generally. Um, at six least. Six months. So, Brenton, why are we ignoring our rule for this particular episode? Well, this is kind of a funny instance because it's got different release dates depending on your region. Uh, mm. So this premiered at the Cannes Film Festival back in May, I think it was. And it did very well. It was unanimously voted as the best of show. It won the Palm d'Or. Which is the Golden Palm Award. Yeah, it's the highest award, um, and it's the only Korean film to ever do so. So it was very highly praised at the Cannes Film Festival. And then later on in July, I believe it was, it was released here in Australia. Um, And it's only been released fully worldwide to the US and Canada, November 11th, I believe it was. Either way you look at it, either the Cannes Film Festival premiere or released here in Australia, where we've watched it, it's been six months. I'm going to count that. I really like this movie. I think that that counts because I've been seeing buzz for this six months ago. So I think that this has had time to settle into the list, if that makes sense. Well, and the thing too, the people who were hyped about it were film critics. Like, you know what yeah. I mean? The people who are talking about this movie aren't the general public of, you know, the US and Canada. Well, let's just say North America, where movies are a really, really big deal. This premiered first in Europe, and it's a foreign language film, and it's getting that much critical praise. Like, that kind of means something. I think something like Joker, the critics maybe saw it a week before. I feel like they didn't have much time before the general public saw it. Mm. And uh, I think there was mixed reviews. Most of them were positive, though, which is why it's at number 19. Um, I still really want to see that. Yeah, and we will by the time, when it gets to the six-month mark, uh, it's one we'll we, review. We, we may well yeah. see it before then. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that's when we'll talk about it. Okay, do you want to get into the movie? Yes. We saw the trailer for this in theaters, didn't we? No, I don't think it was. We were looking through... Oh, we did a bonus episode over on Patreon where we were discussing what movies should be do for honorable mentions. And I had a bunch of movies that just missed out on being on the top 250 that still great movies so i prepared a bunch of trailers for you and we sat down and watched trailer after trailer and we basically made a list and that was a very good episode um Mm. actually i think i think that comes out next week that bonus episode so if you head over to patreon next week it'll be there extra content for you yeah you'll understand what movies we've picked for the honorable mentions for the next year or two because we went through quite a lot of them um and discussed some great movies that weren't on the list Basically, that trailer was in there when we recorded that a couple of months ago. Uh, So we watched the trailer. Now, I initially remember, I sat there and I watched this and I'm like, this is a thriller. I don't like thrillers. I'm a neurotic. I have anxiety. This stuff gets me too hyped up. It's not, I don't want to watch this. And you're like, it looks okay, though. So that was before I'd ever heard of it. And then since it's been out here, at least... Yeah. I've been hearing a lot of things, seeing a lot on Instagram. So I had that reaction before I'd even heard of it. Initially, I'm like, oh, I don't know. And then I, I'm like, okay, well, I could probably stomach this is what I thought. I still wasn't like super hyped to watch it. It did exceed my expectations. It was different. It was good different, but it was different. I think that there's a definite, distinct first and second act. So. Oh, yeah. Before the spoiler zone, we will only be talking about anything that happens in the first act, in the first 40 minutes, which I think is yeah. completely up for grabs. And that second act we'll get to in spoilers. Yeah, it's not going to wreck anything for you. Yeah. I did just want to talk about the premise. Yep. Which is basically there's two I might families take over of four for people. You because some- and there's a poor family and a, and a very wealthy family. A very wealthy family. Yes. The poorer family, one at a time, ends up getting jobs working in the house for the wealthy family. That's essentially the premise. That's basically what happens. And that's a very fun portion of the movie, I think. I really quite enjoyed that part of it. And is it too spoilery for me to say how they get those jobs? It's not just that they get these jobs. 
they insert themselves into this family. The first person gets his job by a bit of luck and then manipulates his way into getting his whole family employed for this this rich family. Can I just say, generally speaking, the people that are able to pull something like this off, like all four of the family members, the poor ones, yes, they're very smart to be able to pull this off and quick, you know, very good at improvisation. Well, and all of them, they're on the same level. Like, yeah. it's almost like they've done this before. You know what I mean? They have a very interesting relationship. It's like they're all friends first sort of thing. And I kind of like that. But I was going to say, generally people that smart aren't usually down on their luck like this. They're not usually poor. poor. Now, that could possibly just be a cultural thing. This could just be because it's South Korea and I have never been to Korea. Well, technically I have. Um, (laughs) But um, yeah, so it could just be a cultural thing. But I was like, these guys seem way too smart to be in the position that they are in. Because I feel like they could have possibly done something before this in terms of getting themselves up on their feet and get themselves into that position where they're worthy. I think it may have just been an issue of bad luck. Like, you're born into a lower socioeconomic class. It's hard to get out of that, you know? Mm. Like, they talked about all these failed business endeavors. Like, they tried and tried and tried. So it's like, to be able to open and run... Yeah, he talked about, like, a failed cake shop and a failed restaurant. Okay, so that shows that he is ambitious and he is really trying things. It just keeps not working. Okay, I like that better as an explanation because I'm like, why are these these very smart people living this way? They've tried and they've tried. Okay, I really quite like that. I must have missed that uh, bit of detail. Yeah, and I just want to put in there, like, they're so poor, their job, they fold pizza boxes. That's how they get their income. Like, they're that poor. And the movie starts off with them trying to steal Wi-Fi and the the bug extermination. They were trying to steal the get get a yeah, free Yeah, he's like, leave the well. windows open. We'll get rid of the I bugs. I kind of like that. So the movie starts out showing how they're getting by, how they're trying to like cheat around these things. Again, being smart about it, you know. Mm. And I think it's very much as part of a Korean culture to hire through this word of mouth. You've got like this yeah. belt of trust. Um, instead of getting from external source, which you might have more in a Western culture. I was going to say, I don't um, think it would here, happen that same way in North America or Australia. Yeah, that was kind of jarring to me to to notice that, like, oh, who do you recommend for this role? And then they would recommend someone who they've, you know, say that they don't really have any connection with, blah, blah, blah. But you're asking for your advice because you're already friendship with them, you know, you're hired with them. You're asking, what is your advice? And I think that's a cultural thing to hire that way. I think that's something you see a lot more, just that collective communal trust within Asian culture in general. Yeah, that's all I was saying. Because you've got these big, big communities. Like, yeah, no, that's a really interesting point to to bring up and to notice. I was just going to say, because this is a 2019 movie and the most recent movie on the list that we've actually done... I believe was Interstellar only a couple of weeks ago. It was 2014. And everything else, there's a lot of movies on the list from the, from the 90s and from the 70s and 60s. We've been watching a lot for this list. It's kind of nice to see a 2019 movie because this feels like a 2019 movie, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Just, it feels smoother. I don't know what it is, but it's shot differently, as you would see. That said, though, like I was, this thought just popped into my head because I made a note that I said, I really like the cinematography style this is very similar i think to some of the japanese movies we've seen it is smooth yeah but there's a lot of still shots and there's not a lot of panning you know what i mean there's some wide shots but there's not a ton like it just it reminds me of the japanese movies we've seen so far which were filmed remember when we watched harakiri we talked about how that movie really looked like it could have been filmed today Mm. Even though it was older, because what year did that come out? Uh, 62. A lot of the cinematographic style of this actually reminds me of that movie, which I think is interesting. And you see that culturally, too. You see movies like, that's very evidently American, and you see something that's very evidently French. You know what I mean? There's There are yeah. kind of cultural styles. So this, to me, is kind of typically Asian, and... I like it. It's a, it's a really smooth, comfortable watching experience. 
there were a lot of shots that obviously had the camera set up on a tripod and it's watching a frame a beautiful frame of the house with either it's the stairs or it's that lit doorway down to the basement mm. or it's upstairs with the hallway it's all very symmetrical mm-hmm. and then the characters move into in between so i really quite like showing off this beautiful shot and then you have your scene inside rather than focusing on the scene like on the characters yeah which is something that american movies do a lot more of the set is almost secondary yeah and here it's highlighting the beautiful house which it fuck i love that house well, and again, that's something we've seen across all of the Asian films we've seen is that they've got this beautiful, beautiful architecture and they're highlighting it. This is no different. Yeah. This is a... I'd, I'd like to know if this house was made specifically for this movie or if it was... That's a good point, actually. If it was, because the, the story here is that it was an architect's self-designed house that he lived in and then sold and now this family lives in it and blah, blah. And, you know, it's a gorgeous house and it's very... It probably is an existing building. You love it because it's brutalist. Like, it's your style. Yeah, I like the materiality of it's it, the concrete. a lot and the of timber. concrete, and yeah. If there was a way to dress that up a little better, I'd, I'd like to live in a house like that. It just feels too I fancy. like the way they furnished it. Yeah. I'd have to have a lot yeah, of okay. plants and fur, I think, <laughs> in a place yeah, like that. Yeah, plants in a place like that yeah. is beautiful. Yeah. But yeah, that was something that I found really interesting interesting to kind of go wait a minute this is i've seen this before where have i seen this before you know the style yeah it was only when the father got the job that i realized why the movie is called parasite is because this family is taking over the second family uh and i thought that was a really clever interpretation of the the title why the title's there i have a hunch as to a second reason same. That he called the movie Parasite. Same. It's kind of like a double meaning, but yep. um, would you like to get into spoilers? Because this one's pretty spoiler heavy. Yes, because I want to talk about that. Awesome. So I saw a couple of layers to the title of this movie. The first one being, yes, the fact that this family is literally parasitic into the lives of this family that's employing them. They keep, one gets in and they keep multiplying. Um, yeah. The second had actually more to do with that rock that Min. Oh, interesting. The son's name was Ki Wu or Kevin. His friend is the one who got him this job for this family and he gives him this rock, he says, from his grandfather, who's like a geologist. And this rock is said to be really good metaphysically for bestowing material wealth on the owner. And towards the end of this movie, when shit's really starting to hit the fan and stuff's going wrong... He grabs this rock from their flooded house and he takes it with him to the shelter where they're staying. And his dad says, why did you grab that? And he said, it's just clinging to me. I'm looking at it on a second level as this rock and the powers behind this rock have become parasitic to them. It's forcing them to do these things that are ultimately not going to be good for them and in the end actually really ruins their lives. And so, and that's when you see, when, when at the end, when they finally get out of everything, is when he puts that rock in the river. Yeah, okay. I don't think that's making them wealthier. I think that's a, I think it's meant to be a good luck charm, and you're saying it's a bad luck charm? Well, no, it's meant to be a good luck charm, but unfortunately, it's kind of a yin and yang thing. You can't have good without bad. You know what I mean? It's helping them in a material way, but it's taking them from them emotionally. Yeah, okay. This is just my interpretation. Yeah, that's fine. I don't know what yeah. else the meaning of the rock would be. Well, it's just interesting because, like, it comes up a few times. It does. And, like, it's interesting, too, because this thing that ultimately brought them their success brings them their demise, too. Like, he literally gets smacked in the head with it. You know what I mean? And almost died. Yeah. So it's this thing that you willingly accept and then when it becomes like it comes out of control and almost kills you like a parasitic mm. person okay. can do. It's an interesting interpretation. That's actually what happened to the family, like to the to the rich family too. They willingly it, it accept the help of these them. people. Yeah, yeah. And it grew and ended up killing them. So it's just an interesting parallel that I picked yeah. up. I think it's a great title. Oh, I think it is too. I think it's very fitting. And it's not like giving anything away at all. It could mean anything until you watch it and you're like, oh, that's actually a brilliant title. (laughs) If anything, it steers you in the wrong direction because I'm like, parasite, ew. You know, like, that's like, that's like if you called something suicide, you know? Yeah. Like, gross word. 
with gross meaning and you're just like Ugh. like this isn't gonna be good and this movie is actually very funny it is especially the first half yeah so you go into it thinking it's gonna be this big serious thriller and it's really not well i think it's marketed that way i think it only gets thriller like over an hour into the movie yeah well i felt like it was marketed that way based on the trailer it looked like it have you seen the poster no it's got a dead body in the yard and the characters that are standing around have a sensor bar over their eyes, like they're criminals sort of thing. Um, so I guess the, so the poster definitely mean? does look like it's a thriller. Yeah, and so, but you it go into is. it. I don't know what genre we would count this as. I would, but it's not like, I don't know, it's, it's a kind of its own kind of thing. So I just wanted to say, my initial reaction of this movie was, I loved it. Except for the ending. I hated the ending. But then, we watched this probably five days ago. Mm. It's really stuck with me for the last few days. And particularly the imagery throughout the movie has really stuck with me. And I'm kind of interested to immediately rewatch it. And I think I really like the ending now. And I love movies that do that. In order for me to change my mind after a few days of actually thinking about it and realizing how many layers there is, that's brilliant filmmaking. Is it because it was so abrupt that initially you didn't like it? Initially, but I th also thought I didn't like the way it ended. But So we'll talk about that later, um, but I'm just saying my initial reaction. What was your initial impression of this? So we watched it in two parts. We watched the first half, then the second half, and we hit it pretty much right at that halfway mark. So it was like, holy, that was a switch. It was almost exactly, yeah. We finished it, the first half, at that point where... You see the guy coming up from the basement, and that just fucking shook me, man. You, The guy living in the basement comes up, and you just see his huge white eyes peering out of this blackness, and this little kid just goes into a seizure. And I'm like, I fucking would too, and I'm 24 yeah. years old. He thought he saw a ghost. They think that basement goes nowhere. Yeah, so it's just like... That's so fucked up, by the way. Like uh, that like, whole tray. Uh, Ugh. The, the hairs just stood up on the back of my neck again. That's what stuck with me. Like, that just made me so uncomfortable yeah. <laughs> for, like, the couple days over which we were watching this movie. It was just, ugh. that's what really stuck with me more than anything else was just the that idea. Imagery, yeah. Well, and just the idea that you could have someone living in your house and you wouldn't know about it. Like, how scary is that? Well, I've seen that happen in real life, where people are, like, living in people's attics, and you don't realize until, like, months or years later when you realize, oh, fuck, someone's been living in my house, living in the walls of my house. Like, you'd want to leave after that. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I've seen real-life events where that's happened in the U.S. Yeah, like, that's just so creepy. And I think that's what stuck with me more than, more than anything else, because this, honestly, this looks like something that could happen. Like, that uh, somebody could yeah. take over this way. And then it really takes a hard turn in terms of what makes it a really interesting story with people living hidden in the house and then everybody dies and everything. There's a note that I wrote down towards the end. I said, for something with no real confrontation or violence, this is actually really intense. Like, it's a really tense moments. I wrote that yeah. just before the actual confrontation and violence started. So I think yeah. the elements that are very quiet and you're just sitting there on the edge of your seat, like it's there's some moments where nothing's happening, but it's so tense. And I love those moments because I'm like, holy fuck, what is going to happen here? Well, and it just shows like how well written and filmed and directed it was to yeah. portray that level of emotion and intensity. If I'm so freaking uncomfortable watching something, that director did their job very, very well. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and there were moments in this where I'm just like, oh my god. I wanted to talk about the moment where the whole movie changes, right? This is the beginning of the second act. I think this is a great example of the butterfly effect. They were sitting at the rich people's house, getting drunk, celebrating their new life, quote unquote, because they've basically taken over this house. And yeah. then the front door rings. Yeah. If they didn't answer that front door, they'd be living on High Street. But because they answered that front door, it started a chain of events that led to everyone's demise. One of the girls was killed. 
the dad was killed of the rich family. The other dad was been was hiding. They're all fugitives, basically. Yeah. Completely changed the entire family dynamic for both of them just because she answered that front door. Yeah. I think it's. I think I love seeing these things. The proof of the butterfly effect and how that works. So this one little moment completely changes the world. Like a few years later. And the change in the pace of the story because the whole second half happens over less than 24 hours. You know, we've got weeks yeah. leading up and then it's just like, whoosh, yeah. at the end. And it just, it really adds to, like, that sense of overwhelm and stuff. Mm. No, I'm totally with you. Like, Well, even, so the second act wouldn't have happened without that phone call. And I don't think the first act or any of the movie would have happened without that first interaction with Min at the beginning. Where yeah. he suggested the job in the first place if he hadn't done that then none of them would have had any jobs and the status quo would have continued on and i just Mm. i find it fascinating seeing like pinpointing everything down to one moment where if this one thing didn't happen you'd have your sister alive and your father wouldn't be a fugitive and all the rest of it i just it's fascinating me i really quite like the story of this it's very simple and yet there's got so many layers well, that's, I think those make the best stories when it's like a very simple premise because then you have so much to build on. Whereas if it's so complicated, you're going to get lost. You know yeah. what I mean? No, I'm really, I, I agree with you. Do you want to talk a bit more about the characters? Yeah, if you'd like. I really liked Jessica, the sister. I think she yeah. was the smartest one out of all of them. I really like that character. Oh god, yeah. And she was a great actress too because yeah. she was she was one of those people she's got a very young face, but Well, so did the mum of the rich. She was almost 40, but man, she looks good. <laughs> I just I really liked Jessica or Ki Jung was her Korean name, her character because she's very innocent looking, but she's a fox. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you see that like just, I think the fact that she smoked really added that to her character. Like, it's like, I'm not who I look like. I'm not who you think I am. Yeah, okay, is kind yeah. of the vibe that gave me. Like, she's a master forager. And, I mean, the fact that she was able to pull off faking that she was an art psychologist and art therapist. Yeah. She's like, I just Googled what it was. You know what I mean? I think that's a combination of her being brilliant and this other mom being very, very naive. And I had a really laughable moment when that woman says to her, you don't know much about the world. You're very naive still, (laughs) you know? Yeah, when she's actually the one who's naive. Yeah, incredibly naive. I just thought that was really interesting. It's shown off really well when Kevin goes to introduce her. And they're standing at the front gate. And just before she presses the doorbell, she has that little jingle. Yeah. She's the Jessica only child in Illinois, Chicago. So yeah. that's actually on a tune of a very popular South Korean jingle. Like, everyone knows that tune. And she just okay. changed the, the lyrics as a way to, to remember that. Like a mnemonic. Yeah. Yeah. I really like the way she acts in that because her face is like, no, no, no. Let's do this. And then she starts doing the jingle. And she's like, okay. And then she presses the button. This, I don't know. The whole sequence, yeah. I really love the way she's portrayed in that in that yeah. sequence. It just, I really liked it. And I think the whole Jessica jingle thing has taken off. I think people have it for like reading tones oh, and really? stuff. Yeah. It's a cool little jingle. And I like the way she it says is. it. Um, yeah. So I think that character has more depth than anyone. And I really like it. I think she's my favorite character. Yeah. Out of this. Where have I seen Mr. Park before? It was his voice more than anything. I'm like, I've heard you before. Was it in James Bond or something? The Rich Dad. Mm, he's not in anything that I've heard of. Mostly uh, just South Korean movies, I guess. Weird. I really feel like I've seen him before. Poor Dad. I forget their names. Yeah. <laughs> the Rich Dad and the Poor Dad. Mr. Kim. Mr. Yeah, Kim. Yeah, Kim. Okay. That, was, that was their last name, was Kim. Yeah, you. the South Korean, yeah. they... Put the last name first. A lot of Asian cultures t- sort yeah. of do that. No, he's he's a veteran actor working with Bong Joon Ho. I think he's done a handful of them. I know he was in Snow- Snowpiercer. I think he's in Okja. He's been in them since two thousand. He's always known for uh, working with Bong Joon Ho. Okay. Anyway, about Mr. Park, he was an asshole. <laughs> 
I don't think that they were. I really quite thought that every character in this was likable. There wasn't really any standout heroes. There wasn't really any standout villains, except for the guy in the basement. What I didn't understand was the dynamic between Mr. Park and Mr. Kim. He he kept like he kept getting mad at him. He kept okay, getting like mad what? at his driver. Just he said like he's always about to cross the line and then he doesn't. And I'm like trying to figure out what that means. And I could kind of see it. I think he was referring to Kim's remark where he's like, "Do you love your wife?" And I'm like, "That's kind of an inappropriate question, right?" And he answered by saying, "Yeah, of mm. course I do." Like, you know. Um so I think that's kind of crossing the line. So I, I, that's what I thought he was referring to when he said that, and I don't think he's out of line in saying that. I think it was just very evident towards the end that these people, they're like, we're willing to have a relationship with you, and we want you to like drop everything and be there for us, and we'll pay you extra, but you're our workers. Like, that's the bottom line. I think that's why everything unfolds at the end. Because when I watch this, right, the big climax is the crazy guy comes out from the basement after fucking, I don't know how the hell Kevin didn't die, by the way. I really thought that he was. He comes out of the basement. Who does he stab first? Was it Jessica? Yeah, so he's mad because his wife died. So he hits Kevin on the head with that big fuck off rock. This yeah. big pool of blood. And then he comes up, grabs a kitchen knife, stabs Jessica in the chest when she's going to right. go give Da Song, the little boy, his birthday cake. Bear in mind, too, this is the guy that this little kid saw and thought was a ghost. So, like, how would you oh, not fuck, shit yourself? Yeah. yeah, right? Which is probably why he fainted. Yeah. Well, he started having a seizure again. He started foaming at the mouth. Yeah. And was just like, woo! Um, then he takes the big hot dog sword and hits Chung Su, the mum. Like, starts cutting her with it, and she stabs him in the- like, skewers him in the side with it, so that he looks just like another sausage on this fucking stick. And then, Kim grabs the knife, and goes and stabs the dad, Park. Yeah. Which, that's the point where I'm like, oh, what the fuck, why did you do that? Because you didn't have to do that. So that was what I was like, I don't like that at all, because they were completely in the right, you know, until that point which completely changed and ruined their family. Mm -hmm. So I've been thinking about it now, and I thought it was because he he grabs his nose to think that, oh, the keys stink, because he was saying that he stinks. He's got that poor people stink about him. So he was grabbing the keys, being like, oh, fuck, I don't usually want to touch the keys. It's the driver's business to do that. But I think plus he has to roll this dead guy off the keys. That as well. Um, But I think it was more of like, Kim's daughter just died. Got stabbed in front of him. Yeah. And yet Park's like, no, forget about that. Take my son to the hospital because I'm paying you. I'm more important than you. Now, understandably, he doesn't know that she's his daughter. But still, there are people very injured all over the house. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And he's being like, no, come drive me. You know, he was was screaming at him to come take my son to the hospital because you're my worker. And that's... Building off what you had said before, where mm. even after everything, even though you're you're kind and you've invited this person to your house, you've given him a job, you still think that you're better than them, which is why I yeah. think he stabs him. It was more than just the sting. That's I think it absolutely was what I think. Right. I didn't pick up on that initially watching it. I think that was just the very final bit is not only is it that you think you're better than me, but you think you're so much better than me that like this person just died and you're going to hold your nose. Yeah. Because he's lesser than you or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, it, like that's really disrespectful, too. Which is why I think he's full of adrenaline. He's not thinking straight, and he's like, nah, fuck you. Everyone else is getting stabbed. You should be stabbed, too. So I can see that he's running on pure emotion. It was very jarring. Um, yeah. But I think I kind of like it in the end, because I can see his motivations a little bit more. I don't know. I didn't like that character, Mr. Park. Yeah, I I can see why. I didn't really have a problem with any of them. I just think it was very evident all through that he really thought he was better because he had money. Yeah. Like, even his wife wasn't really like that. She was just clueless, but harmless because she was clueless. He wasn't clueless in any way, you know? I thought it was also very jarring to, like, they kind of skipped ahead because it was the Kevin was in a coma. Was he in a coma? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. And they're like, 
oh, no one can find your dad. The house has been sold to a new new German family. No one was living there for a long time. Everything has changed. Like, your sister is dead. You've been in a coma for so long. It just felt very different. Were they saying that to him? It was announced, yeah, because it was, okay. I believe it was in the letter from his dad from the Morse code. Yeah. Right, okay. Yeah, see, it's very confusing. The whole Morse code thing lost me. Like, that's a very long letter, by the way. He was he was saying during narration towards the end there, and he just yeah. happens to type it out every night on Morse code, and the family doesn't want to change their light. Like... Just in case the son comes and has a look and deciphers the letter. Like, there was a big what if there, and I'm like, I don't know about yeah. that. Yeah. Also, very fucked up. So these people thought that they had a sensor light every day. Instead, there's a guy in your basement turning it on and off. Is that actually yeah. what it was? That's ridiculous. Yeah. Can you imagine if you were living in that house for years thinking you've got a sensor light? For these three lights that turn on in order as you walk up them. And instead, there's a guy in the basement switching them on and off. Well, and this guy was deranged, too. Oh, as you would be. Before he gets stabbed, he's like, Mr. Park, respect. You know what I mean? Like, he goes and he kills these people because not only have they killed his wife, they've disrespected Mr. Park. And this guy has no idea who the fuck he is. Why did he have so much respect for him? Because he's living in his house. Right, okay. He's eating his food, yeah. you know? And this guy doesn't know, but he's like, even though you don't know, like, I still owe you my life. And every night, like, that flicker, he's saying thank you in Morris Code with those lights. Mm. Like, that's where the Morris Code initially came from, because by right, the lights, yeah. which he's got that the translation table for Morris Code for the letters, and he's typing out thank you every night. Like, it is. It's very creepy. <laughs> also, the kid was in the backyard the night before his birthday party where all this went down. And he yeah, couldn't sleep, true. and he's writing down this Morse code because he was a Boy Scout. Mm -hmm. That didn't go anywhere. He didn't go, Mom, look at this. I translated the message from the lights. What's going on here? He didn't say anything. He just he wrote it down, and I thought, oh, fuck. Shit's going to go down from this. And nothing really came of it. I have a reason for that. I think, first of all, he didn't put help me. No, there was a message, though. Yeah, there was, but it, he translated it wrong. Plus, he's like seven years old. Does he know how to speak English? Would he look at that and actually see that it means anything? Mm, is Morse code purely in English? It looked like he they were translating it into English. Okay. There was a fair bit of this movie that was in English and in Korean. Yeah, okay. So he translated it wrong, plus we didn't see that he actually finished it. It said HALP M. He didn't actually finish. I thought that he had finished it. I just, if if it didn't lead anywhere, why put it in there at all? So there's a Morse code theme? I don't know. Yeah, okay. Just, I it's hear you. sort of like yeah. showing that Morse code could be told with the lights. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I think the ending is really telling of... Continuing the status quo, essentially, because the movie starts out with them living in a basement, and then there's a rich family in the house, and then it ends up with him still living in a basement, and then there's a new rich family living in the house. I feel like he's he's trying to sort of end it where it began, or am I looking into that too yeah. much? Yeah. Well, no, I think you're right, and I thought that was actually even a third meaning to the title, is that this house always has a parasite in it. That nobody knows about. Well, that was my second point, where, why I thought Parasite was a good title. Like, this house is haunted with an actual person. Like, that's crazy. They were always, at some point, mooching off someone else. Either it's the Wi-Fi, the extermination, either it's the food in the basement. Um, yep. Or the accommodation at the house, or the alcohol that they're stealing. There was always a continuation there, and I think he was trying to show that, I guess. Mm. So I think I liked the ending better now that I've really thought about it, but it was very jarring and abrupt when I first saw it. And I think that was kind of part of it, too, because everything was going so smoothly, and then in a matter, like I said, of 24 hours, everything comes crashing down in a really, really horrible way. Yeah. I don't know how Jessica died and Kevin didn't. Like, I feel like she was a lot less injured than he was. I think she got stabbed right in the heart. Oh, okay. Um, and Dahai took him out, so she would have made sure he got right to a hospital right away. Like, he was already out of the yard and into somewhere a lot sooner than 
Jessica ever would have been. From the basement? Yeah. She remembers she carried him out on his, on her back. Oh, she was yeah, okay. him. Yeah. Yeah. Still, severe head trauma. Like, the likelihood of him being okay is very yeah, slim. Yeah, especially with all um, that blood. Holy fuck. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, so I really liked it. I think it was brilliant. I liked it, too. I really did. I, and I, I'm happily surprised, and I say that a few times, but, like, I'm finding I really quite enjoy Asian cinema. Yeah. There's something about it. Like, anything I've seen that's been, like, uh, Japanese produced, Chinese produced, this is Korean produced, like, it's just been really good. There's a couple more on the list coming up, and a few more in the honorable mentions that I want to do that are very well-known Asian cinema, uh, a couple of Chinese and Japanese, that I'd like you to watch. Uh, I think one of them is in Hong Kong. There's a handful of people in my mind where it's like, I'm interested in every project that you're working on from here on. And there's probably about half a dozen Mm -hmm. people in there. He quickly became one of those people, even though I've only seen two of his films. You're just like, there's something about you. There's something about it, and I like that he seems to be doing what he wants. And he's not just pumping out shit. He puts in the effort to make this art, and he puts in these extra meanings so you can read into it, and it's valuable on rewatches. Well, and I'm just glad that there's an artist doing that who's being successful, who people are actually enjoying watching. I mean, successful with the people and the critics. That's what I mean. Like, you see some of these indie films, and it's like, I see what you're going for, you didn't quite nail it, or I see what you're going for and you did, but why does this? Why is this not more well-known? I'm yeah. glad that this is really well-known, it's getting the praise, it's super interesting, it's really well done. Like, I'm just, I'm glad for him. And that's got to be really meaningful as a foreign film creator, like mm. foreign to the Western world, foreign to North America, because generally speaking... They don't get those spots. They don't get the appraisal. You yeah, know what I unless mean? it's so, more English speaking and on Netflix, like is that the previous ones. That's another one. This is one I had only a little bit of trouble with the subtitles. Some parts can be very fast, but it wasn't too bad. This was a Korean film made for both Korean and English audiences. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, because... We watched City of God, and that was really hard for me to follow because it was a Brazilian film made for a Brazilian audience. So it was really hard to follow. This yeah. one wasn't hard to follow. So if you're looking for really good foreign language film, Parasite, it was really good. Really good film. Forget foreign language film. Really good movie. I quite like that it had ups and downs. You can pull elements out of it that's comedy, some of that's drama, some that's thriller. And I kind of like that, because I was, I was laughing at a lot of the points in this as well. Mm. We have been Danielle and Brenton this week. Thanks for joining us. Feel free to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Check us out on all the socials. Some people have asked me, what does that actually mean? What is socials? And I would like to tell you, anything that plays podcasts, you can find us. We are most active on Instagram. We have Patreon. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, all the socials. You know, that's why we say everything, because we can be found on everything. We really made a point of making sure that we were accessible on as many platforms as possible. Yeah, so so to clarify... seriously. Everything is what that means. Yeah. This is why we sum it up as socials. And SoundCloud, you can support us on Patreon. We've got every episode uncut, unedited, and a week earlier than usual, um, as well as bonus episodes every month, polls on voting what you want to hear, over on WeRDB on Patreon. And until next week, thanks for listening.